Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone, and a uh, very warm welcome to the eighth meeting in 2018 of the Social Security Committee. Can I remind everyone to turn mobile phones and other devices to silent as, so they don't disrupt the meeting or the broadcasting? Um, uh, agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private and ask members if they're content to take items three, four, and five in private. Yes. Thank you very much. Agenda item two is um, a panel session on the Social Security Tribunal. Um, it's on the Scottish Government's proposals for a new so Scottish Social Security Tribunal. And uh, I'd like to welcome the members of the first panel and thank them for their um, submissions um, prior to today's meeting. Um, so I'd like to welcome Andy Little, who's a Welfare Rights Officer for Midlothian Council. Stephen McAvoy, who's Senior Welfare Rights Advisor for Enable Scotland. Paul McCormick, Welfare Rights Officer, Govan Hill Housing Association. And Jean Smith, who's a Welfare Reform and Officer Debt Advisor, but here in a personal capacity, not re representing our council. Um, as an opening question, and I thank you all for, for, for your submissions again, um, I, I'd just like um, a, a general question about mm. the regard to the Social Security Charter and what difference you think that, that will make to how the tribunal might operate. I don't know who would, if anyone would like to go first on that one. Well, I just pick someone. Oh, Jane, could you, <laughs> would you like to go? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, in general terms, I think it's a really good idea. And it's nice to see general principles being debated appropriately coming through Parliament all of that. Um, I think I've, in my submission, I've made at one point a small comment about um, Rule 2, Rule 3, the bit about over the overriding objectives, and said I'd still quite like to see those enshrined in detail in the law as well. But that's not a comment on the Charter. I think the Charter's a good idea. It's quite nice to see... Um, I'm stepping out with my, my, my area of expertise at the minute, but it's quite nice to see Old Scots Law had the idea of things coming from principle rather than from case law. And actually, it kind of feels like a bit of a nod to that, and I think that's really nice. Thank you. Uh, Mr McCormick, would you like to...? <coughs> yeah, I would endorse much of what Jane has said, um, certainly in terms of general principles seem to be... Um, I think there's very little to disagree with in that regard. Um, Again, I would endorse Jane's views. Okay. Any further comments? Any additions to what's been said already, Mr. McAvoy? We support yeah. um, the, the principles in general. Um, I don't think we're either convinced either way that it necessarily needs to be within the legislation for appeal tribunals, um, because I think there's an argument that the overriding objective might cover the um, charter in any case in practice. Um, so I'm not entirely convinced either way that they need to be actually enshrined within the legislation here. Okay. And Mr Little, do you want to add anything? You? I don't have anything to add to that, no. Okay, that's um, great. Thank you. I'm going to open up to members. I'll bring in Ms McNeil. Uh, good morning and thanks for your submissions. Um, can I start by um, thanking Paul McCormack for your paper and there's some questions I had which probably apply to everyone. So my first question relates to um, the concerns you have around um, determination, redetermination. Um, so you'll be aware when the committee was taking evidence from the minister that the new provisions set out that um, the Scottish ministers will not be adopting that specific model, that it will be a determination done by another member of staff within the agency. That claim is to be done afresh. Mm. And the suggestion is that that would have a different outcome than, see the DWP. Um, and I, I note specifically um, that as a result of your FOI request, 80 per cent um, of redeterminations made with an unfavourable outcome. So I can understand why you're concerned about that. Yes. I had pursued the issue at stage two. Um, in addition to that, that perhaps there should be an automatic way of um, appealing because of my, my concerns around that. But I just wondered if you were satisfied um, that, that Scottish ministers 
what, say they're adopting a different model. What do you think about that? Are you suggesting that there would be no requirement for redetermination, that there would be an initial, an, an initial determination which would then carry right of appeal? Yeah, they've removed the word mandatory, but I mean, it is to all intents and purposes mandatory, is my understanding. But, it would, but, but what the, I suppose the key thing is that ministers are telling the committee that there would be a different agency member who mm -hmm. would look at the claim afresh. Yes. And the implication being that the outcomes would be uh, different from the DWP experience? The, I think if going back to 2013 when the concept of a mandatory consideration to use a devolved language was first introduced, the intention was that that would perhaps reduce the number of appeals um, that would proceed, you know, the number of cases that would proceed to an appeal hearing. Uh, we now know that be, because of the statistics that we've been able to pro provide that that has in fact not been the case. Um, it would pr probably be over cynical on my part to suggest that it was used as a, perhaps a deterrent, a further deterrent to, to disencourage people to, take, to exercise a right of appeal. Uh, it was a tier of, a, of adjudication, and my colleagues may take a different view, but certainly I thought was unnecessary, served no real purpose, and in, oh, very often, as I said, did um, have the effect of making people believe that they had no right of, of success if they took their case on to the next stage of adjudication, which would be an independent appeal tribunal. I think the other point that was very, very relevant that became very clear to us when it was first introduced was for the, the purpose of a mandatory consideration, again, to use the old language, always was that if you could provide additional evidence, it gave the, the, the new decision maker the opportunity to reconsider the case afresh. Our difficulty is that there was no way of obtaining additional evidence at that stage because legal aid wasn't available because the case at that point wasn't subject of appeal. And around about the same time, most surgeries, if we're talking about medical appeals here, most surgeries in the Glasgow area actually had signs up saying, please don't ask us for any evidence letters in relation to benefit matters. So essentially we were going through a process where there was very, very little chance of success. And it was essentially going through the motions to get to the other end so that we could then exercise our right of the client could, could then exercise right of appeal, at which point we were in a position to gather evidence which hopefully would then lead to an uh, independent tribunal taking a different view. And the statistics would certainly bear that out because the, the turnaround on appeal, um, essentially the number of cases that were successful on appeal that had been refused at mandatory consideration was quite stark. Um, and that's why I provided the uh, Freedom of Information request, just to, to evidence that fact. So it's, it, I don't know if I've answered your question there. So w would your preference then be just, just a direct appeal? Yes, that's the way it always Not was prior to 2013. Not in between, is that the Pri position of the panel? Yes. That prior to 2013, a decision, if it was unfavourable, carried an automatic right of appeal without the obligation to go through the request for a mandatory consideration. The only benefit that still remains that way today would be a housing benefit decision which carries automatic right of appeal. All other benefits don't. We just saw it as an, saw it as an unnecessary tier of adjudication uh, in addition to our workload and an ad additional stress for someone trying to exercise a right of challenge against an unfavourable decision. Thank you. I have another question, but I'm happy to wait. Um, if, is there anyone to, to come in on that area? Ruth? Ruth. Mm -hmm. Good morning, panel. Thanks for being here. Um, I, I wonder, obviously, you're, you're reflecting. It's difficult because what we're trying to do is something new. So obviously, ref you reflect on, on the old system and, and what happened uh, with it. Um, what the government tell us they're proposing is something that is, is different and that there's not, you, you know, it's an, the, everything's going to be lifted at and looked at again. It's not about having that requesting additional medical information. And I just, I, I hear what you say about it being a detent and, and we don't want it to be a detent to appeal, but I can't help but feel that there should be an opportunity for the agency to fix it. And the reason I'm saying that is in terms of speed of getting money to my constituents that are, that are needing it. Could you reflect on that aspect of it at all? I think I do. You know, even in the old system, there was always the possibility that the, 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 agency making the decision could change the decision before it got to appeal. Mm -hmm. So that could already happen. And I would, you know, wholeheartedly agree with um, what Paul said in that the old system of, of, of man, the system of mandatory reconsideration isn't working. The statistics show that. And what's proposed now is really, to my mind, simply a redesign 
on the basis of just changing the wording. It's a redetermination rather than a reconsideration. And I think I would definitely support direct lodgement to the appeal once the decision has been made. And I, I note the policy position paper that was out on redetermination and appeals, which goes through the stages of what the new system will be, and it includes an independent rerun. It's a simple process with clear procedures and timescales, providing meaningful redress. And it goes on to say at the end um, that we have considered this proposal but deemed it inappropriate as our system is built differently from House and Benefit Appeals and it is not directly comparable. The automatic forwarding of appeals would place a significant administrative burden on the agency. It would also take away an individual's right to choose as they would not have the option to decide how they want to proceed at the conclusion of the redetermination stage. I would say that once the person set off on the journey to challenge the decision, that should allow to go to the, to the end process if they don't want to take the case further to appeal, they could withdraw the appeal. Mm. So I think that streamlining the process makes sense. Okay. And I think while what you're looking at doing in changing the culture and changing the way decisions are looked at is laudable, we still have to look at the long-term process, the time it takes. And I think simplifying the system to take out the, the redetermination would make sense. Also, I think the, the further point I would make add on to that I think the point I was making about how um, 20, uh, Section 29 of the Social Security Bill and the, the point about what happens when the case gets to appeal, at the moment the tribunal is only really going to look at the issue under appeal. You know, the, the, I think the, the relevant legislation suggests that the tribunal need not consider the, the part not appealed and there's obviously a protection there for the appellant once they get to the appeal. What you're proposing is a fundamental sea change as far as I can see because the whole decision is going to be on the table to be looked at again. So that obviously has a big impact on whether people are going to decide to take a case to appeal. And I think that would be, um, if that is what happens, that will be something that stops people from going to appeal because they'll have to think very carefully about whether they're going to come out of the appeal better off or actually worse off because something will be taken from them. Um, so that, that would be my concern. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Is it on this point, Alison? Yeah, please. I, I just want to be clear. So I, I think what you're saying there is this potentially could be a very negative experience and people would be scared of finding themselves in a worse position than, than that in which they started. So I just want to be clear that you're not satisfied with the changes that have been made um, and that you... It's a very big opportunity to radically change the system in favour of, of justice by removing mandatory reconsideration. And I think the, the, the way the legislation stands just now, I think you need to think very carefully about when the person is coming to the appeal, what the outcomes are open to the tribunal, what the tribunal can decide to do. At the moment, I think the way things stand, there would have to be something really strange in the decision that's been made to allow a tribunal to go in and look at it again. What you're proposing means any case that goes to tribunal, the tribunal can look at everything at large again. So the redetermination is going to be redetermined again from fresh, whereas at the moment when you go to an appeal, technically what you're looking at is the, 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 the bit under appeal. So say someone's got standard daily living, but they're contesting mobility, the tribunal would most times look at mobility. Now, then, you know, you can look at everything. So that then puts the onus on a, on a representative to, to be saying very clearly to the appellant, look, you know, if you go to this tribunal, they might look at what's already been awarded. They might reconsider that. They might take it away from you. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. I think that's very clear. Okay, uh, Mr. Tompkins. Thank you, convener. Good morning, everyone. Um, I find this um, conversation really interesting and also really important. I think, you know, the, the designing um, the system of public administration um, that does as often as it possibly can um, get it right first time for what are often very vulnerable um, clients and citizens um, and understanding what the appropriate relationship is between the um, ability of the agency um, to uh, correct inadvertent errors before we get into the tribunal system on the one hand and on the other hand having as, as open and transparent and easily accessible tribunal system on the other is, 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 is obviously a critical design question in terms of um, uh, the Social Security uh, Bill and these regulations which flow from it. So can, in, in that context, can I, can I ask you two questions? First is, is it not good administrative practice to have internal review 
before within the agency before you get to the tribunal system? And is that not what mandatory reconsideration or mandatory redetermination in effect is? G giving the opportunity to the agency to correct inadvertent errors before we get out of the agency and into the tribunal system. That seems to me to be good administrative practice and in principle to be welcomed and endorsed rather than criticised. So that's my first question. And my second question is, if we were to move away from a position of mandatory reconsideration or mandatory redetermination with direct immediate access to the tribunal system, how many additional cases would the tribunals have to hear? What is the additional burden on the tribunal system that that policy proposal would entail and how would you propose to pay for it? Clearly there, I think if you get it right first time, that means that the agency has got it right first time and therefore that should lessen the number of cases going to appeal. So, you know, why does the agency need two bites at the cherry to get it right? Maybe they should get it right first time. Well, I'm sure the agency will try and get it right first time in every case. But we all know, all of us with any experience of public administration in any domain, in any jurisdiction, know that that doesn't always happen. Bureau you know, bureaucracies sometimes make mistakes, sure. uh, honest mistakes and other sorts of mistakes. Giving the agency two opportunities to get it right rather than just one, presumably, is going to double the number of times that they get it right before we get out of the agency and into the tribunal system. But one of the things, obviously, that you're keen to do is change the culture and you're focused on getting it right first time so I'm not going to belabor the point but if you get it right first time yeah. then the case goes to appeal and okay. it's done quicker and sure. the person gets justice quicker you know and because of the big problem in mandatory reconsideration is it puts people off and it, it, it delays things um, and, I, and I think that's you know that's the issue I would have with that. I've got a number of members wanting to come in sure. in this area but I'm going to bring in Mr McAvoy. Ms Smith and Ms McCormick to comment before I bring the members back in. So, Ms McAvoy. In terms of giving the agency a second right. chance to correct any errors prior to mandatory considerations being introduced, if the person got a decision that they disagreed with and they lodged an appeal, a decision maker would then have to produce a bundle of papers that would be sent to the tribunal. So that bundle of papers would need to clarify the date of decision, what the issues were, which the evidence were. So that opportunity was already built into the system anyway, because prior to the actual appeal being heard, or even in the creation of the submission papers, there was always options for the decision-making body to say, right, we've made the wrong decision, and to revise it at that point. So I think even if you allow people to directly lodge an appeal, that opportunity to get the decision right prior to any appeal being heard still exists, because it could be changed even at the point when you're producing the bundle of papers to send to the appeal tribunal. So can I just clarify that process then? Because obviously um, what we're talking about is, is automatic appeal for, mm -hmm. for any decision. Um, so, so in that process, the person would still make the decision as to whether or not to yes. appeal. So the person would get a decision, decide that they disagreed with it, lodge an appeal. The decision-making body would get notice of that. In order to have the appeal be heard, they would need to produce the bundles of papers to show how they arrived at that decision. And that point to me is a clear opportunity to look at the decision again afresh, to prepare your case, be sure that you're happy with it. If you're happy with it, you send it to tribunal. If you're not, then you've got the opportunity to revise it before it gets to that point. Okay, I'm going to bring in Miss Smith. Um, right, I'll try not to completely repeat what's just been said. Um, I think the first thing is, I would completely agree, good administrative practice means review your decision. Don't make it unnecessarily formal. Correct it at the first possible stage. But going straight to appeal actually doesn't preclude that because, as is being said here, at the point where the claimant puts the appeal in, under the previous system, the very old system, when you went straight to appeal, it was reviewed anyway in-house. It just cut out the kind of fairly long process of the claimant having to set out arguments twice, it automatically being reviewed at some length according to long processes within the agency. So actually, I think the business of going straight to appeal, where it is looked at in-house anyway, it has to be, but also it was, is actually probably cheaper, my suspicion would be. It's certainly easier and clearer for claimants who habitually refer to what we would call mandatory reconsideration as, I want to appeal. So it's clearer and simpler for claimants, but it doesn't preclude sorting things out in-house. If anything, it makes it quicker because there's a time limit process going on. So people make a fairly quick decision about, is this worth looking at in detail, changing in-house and it not going to appeal? or else it goes to appeal, rather than forming, you know, a long backlog of reconsideration cases, 
within the agency. It's maybe worth saying, because I'm very old, that um, there was a process, I think at the end of the 1980s, where you asked for a review and then you went to appeal, for some cases at least, and that was got rid of because of the amount of time the agency spent on reviews when cases were going to appeal anyway. Lastly, so many cases fail at mandatory reconsideration that it's a very expensive way of doing things. It's an expensive additional step. So, yeah, I would agree. Mr McCormick? Just to endorse, uh, and again, it's to stress the point, uh, one of the, the concerns we had when mandatory consideration was introduced in 2013 for the, the, the UK benefit system was our first question was, why would you need to introduce a further re a tier of review when if a claimant submits an application for appeal, there's an automatic review carried out by the decision by the decision of the agency anyway. And if they decide not to change their mind, then the case sails on to appeal. It was the idea that this further tier of adjudication was introduced to the, we, that, that raised our concerns. I think our concerns are well borne out if we look at the statistics in terms of Going back to the, the second point that was raised, um, the number of mandatory considerations where there was no, de no decision change, which was running at around about 86%, each of those cases, most of those cases would have run on to appeal. The overturn on appeal for employment support allowance cases was a 69% success rate, and for personal independence payment, a 61% success rate. So it kind of called into question the uh, entire process of the, this middle tier of adjudication that was introduced because clearly when tribunals were looking at cases they, they didn't disagree with the view of the second decision maker who was carrying out the mandatory consideration and it is an additional strain on people who you're trying to encourage to exercise a right of appeal to say yeah we'll get to appeal but we need to go through this process to get to that second stage and that's not always an easy thing to do when you've got people who feel vulnerable and are unsure about exercising the right of appeal getting the case straight to appeal, cut out that, that middle tier and made things a lot easier for us, I think. Mr McPherson, are you wanting in on this issue? Yeah, not, not just now. Yeah, and Mr Balfour? Yeah, just on this issue, just uh, to go back to a comment, sorry, I should say at this point, I am a former member of the uh, uh, Tribunal Service and I think I've had all four individuals appeal before me at some point, so it's nice to see you all again um, and welcome. Um, going back to a point made by you, Mr Little, uh, in regards to people being put off by an appeal because the whole case can be opened up. Why would that be different under this new system than is already happening at the moment? Because the tribunal can look at any component that a person has and any award a person has when it comes to a tribunal. So uh, how is that going to change, in because your view, with these new regulations? Because I think what's proposed clearly st states there's no fetter on what the tribunal is going to look at at the moment. The current case law does suggest that there are limits to what the tribunal can do. The tribunal need not look at what is not actually brought before them in appeal. And obviously, you know, as I stressed earlier, that is, you know, going to be based on the, the, the case law that's there that protects the appellant in that area. So I think that's why it could be different, <coughs> because you're moving away from need not consider to just simply saying the whole award can be considered again. Yeah, tribunals do quite often decide to look at the unappealed component, but there has to be a really good reason at the moment, and you're not proposing any reasoning at all about that as, as it stands. That's how I see it. So that's why it would be different. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I go on with other questions? Uh, not if it's on a different area. Yeah, We've got other member yeah. to come in, Mr Adam. Yes, thank you, convener, and good morning. I, I just wanted to ask, because I can understand where you're coming from, because you're dealing, like ourselves as constituency MSPs, you're dealing with it day in, day out, people coming to the door. But are you not kind of coming down from a, a very kind of the, uh, closed kind of view when the minister has said on numerous occasions that the whole point of the new system is that it will be different, they will actually give the, as Adam Tomkin quite rightly said, will give the agency the opportunity to get some of the issues corrected and get it sorted. You know, as, as you said, Andy Little, yourself, the culture change that they're trying to do, is that not the whole point? 
Is that not what you're doing? I can understand, what, as I said, where you're coming from because you're dealing with it day in and day out. But is there not the scope to actually maybe look at there could be ways of this could work in a more positive manner? The culture change is something positive and I think it should work and I hope it will work. But that doesn't mean to say you can't do other things as well. So, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not criticising the fact that you're saying, you know, things have to change. Um, what, I'm, I'm, what I think what we're, what we're saying is that the, the system of mandatory reconsideration as it stands just now doesn't work and the preference would be for direct process to appeal. But the and Minister said, no, sorry to interrupt, Andy, but the <coughs> Minister said on numerous occasions that this isn't mandatory reconsideration as you would believe it. I understand where you're coming from because you're dealing with, you, 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 there would be a certain cynicism towards uh, seeing something that you believe to be similar, but she's saying it's not and that, that it would be actually a fresh set of eyes, someone new looking at it and giving the agency the opportunity to make that difference without putting people under other undue pressure. The only, the only thing I would say to that is that I think there's, there's maybe a, you know, it's been a bit ambiguous with the wording, what you're proposing is really a series of things that are going to change the wording and the way things are looked at. It's not changing the system. And what I think we, I would prefer is that you change this, the, the wording and the system um, to, make, to, to go to a direct appeal. Um, <clears throat> and that's where I would probably dis disagree with where you're coming from. I, I don't think I've got blinkers on. I think that obviously because we do work with people on a daily basis, we see the effects of how the system just now works. I don't oppose the changes that are proposed. I just think that, that possibly it might need something tougher to make it much better. And that would be taking the best parts of both, taking the, the, the new proposal to change the way things are looked at, but also looking at the, the, the route to appeal. And if you get more cases right first time, then that should in theory, reduce the number of appeals in the system. Which is what we're planning to Which is what you want to do. That's to do. an overriding aim, and I and, understand that. And you also have, uh, and not to be disrespectful, saying that the Minister herself has been quite adamant in the fact that her ideas would be that the second look at it would be, you know, fresh set of eyes and an opportunity for the agency to change it. So there's been no, there's no, no ambiguity, I can't even say it, uh, with uh, the Minister's actual, kind of, what she's wanting from it. I don't think it's ambiguous. I think that's a change that, that should be welcomed, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't look at other things either. So mm. I can't say any more than that. Okay. I believe that you know you can make the system even better by doing both. Okay. Uh, I bring in Ms. McAvoy then, Ms. McAvoy. Um, we've kind of consistently said that with disability benefits in particular, it, it's a very, very difficult process. What you're attempting to do is take the massive range of disabilities essentially calibrate them to a points-based test or whatever test you, you, you choose to design and then attach a financial figure to that. I think there's always going to be scope for disagreements and one person would make an award, one person wouldn't. And I don't think you're ever going to get that system entirely 100% perfect. So if you accept that to whatever degree there will be some element of disagreement and that some people will get an incorrect decision, what you then need to look at is, right, if we accept there will be times we make the incorrect decision, we need to make the process a challenge in that as easy as possible. Um, I had an example recently, it was a, parent, a young person with a disability, um, refused the personal independence payment, reconsideration got refused, and at that point initially the person didn't want to proceed any further, they just wanted to let the matter go. Um, I kind of encouraged them that there was a case, eventually they changed their mind, it went to tribunal and it was successful. So if you imagine if that person didn't have support, and even with the system where everything had been reviewed, if the best were in the world, that was even if it's a small percentage where the decision was wrong and that person didn't have the support and they didn't appeal, that, could, that person could have potentially lost it in a significant amount of money. And I think that while well, you're doing something, there's going to be an element of subjective opinion and if you can accept that you will never get it 100% right, I think that it's good to make that system a challenge and as easy as possible. And you can still strive to get to as close to 100% as possible. There's nothing to stop that. But I just think that where the cases where somebody disagrees, particularly when you're dealing with potentially vulnerable groups, that you need to make that process to challenge it as easy as possible so that people don't fall outside of the system. Okay. Um, just a, a, a final point in this, and I understand exactly where you're coming from. As, I, as George Adams says, constituents MSP, it's something that we're faced with almost on a daily basis in terms of navigating this process. 
However, what I understand from what's proposed is that the, the actual consideration will be different in this system because the, the, the person making the decision will have the onus on them to look for the information that they need to make that decision, whereas at the moment it can't done. And that the reconsideration process does that all again. And the, it's not a reconsideration of what evidence is there. It's a reconsideration of the case. And if that person then decides they need more information before making that decision, they can then seek further information as well. Um, so although we're, we're talking about it in the statistics that have all been quoted, um, however worrying they are, are the existing system, Part of the process is also the review and the reporting and everything else. Um, would you be content if, if these figures then in a year's time showed that the, the second reconsideration was actually making a significant difference and fewer things were going to appeal, but more people were getting a result? Would, would that give you some comfort that the new system was embedded in the way that's envisaged by the Minister? We would certainly be happy to see things improve. Um, we would be happy to see more accurate decisions the first time. But I think accepting that we will never, ever get this 100% right, that the process still needs to be as easy as possible to, to challenge a decision. We would certainly welcome anything that makes it, the reconsideration process more thorough, um, the decision-making body more open to reconsidering this, the decision. But I don't see why necessarily having that process mandatory will make it any more likely to be better any other comments, finally? The yeah, only thing I would say is we do have a precedent in terms of the point that has been raised about <coughs> a fresh pay, pair of eyes been look, having a look at the case. 1992, Disability Living Allowance was introduced. When Disability Living Allowance into it was introduced, it was written into legislation that if a case was refused and a review was sought, a different decision maker, a fresh pair of eyes, for want of an expression, would look at that case. Now, I don't have to test it, any statistics to back up what the, the turnaround rate was. What I do know was that there were an exceptionally high number of appeals and disability living allowance cases back then. So we do have a, 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 a predecessor there in terms of how th th that process operating. Yeah, but again, it was the Westminster DWP system, oh, aye, aye, not, absolutely. not the Scottish yeah, system that's proposed. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next area of questioning. Uh, Mr McPherson, who put me in very... Did you want in? No, not just now, thank you. Not just now, thanks. So, um, I'll go to Ms. McGuire. Did you want in on a general I think point? It was Jeremy that was <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I've got all listed down. Ms. Uh, Jeremy, did you? you had yes, did that, here. Two, uh, maybe take us back to uh, the actual regulations, which we're kind of here to talk about uh, today. Um, um, three questions, really, in regards to that. First one is around expenses and the awarding of expenses. I don't know if any of you have any views on that. Um, do you see that as a change in what happens at the moment? And have you looked at this area? Yeah, Mr. McAvoy, yeah. I think if there is concern um, that expenses could be awarded against an appellant, that they would potentially have to be advised of that. And I think for an appellant who's unrepresented, there might be a risk that they might read that and that could potentially cause concern um, and stop them exercising their right to appeal. Ms. Smith, yeah. I wondered what, um, as it were, what mischief it was designed to address, you know, as in this is a new provision at first-tier tribunals. So clearly if you're saying expenses can be awarded against somebody, then I would assume there's a reason for suggesting <coughs> that. And I kind of wondered what it was because, yes, claimants, not always, but in general terms, claimants have no financial resources or very few. So it could be very harsh against a claimant. It also obviously <coughs> could put people off. Um, in terms of the respondent, they're being paid out of public funds. And it feels a little bit unwieldy be, to be saying, well, we'll award expenses against the Social Security Agency, because it's just one body awarding expenses against another one. I couldn't quite see what the issue was it was designed to address. I agree with my colleagues' concerns, but I, I was hoping somebody could maybe say what the reason for it was. I'm not sure the committee would be in a no. position to do that, no. but we can certainly, that's one of the, the reasons for today's um, session uh -huh. is to, to raise these, these areas. Does anyone else want to come in in the area of expenses? Jeremy, do you... Yeah, the, the, the second area is just in regard to the makeup of the tribunals. Um, obviously, 
the ones that we were probably looking at most in regard to DLA PIP and attendance allowance, which at present has three member tribunal, with one of them being someone with a, a disability or experience with disability or working with disability. In, in your view, having a three person tribunal, do you think that should continue or do you think that's too wieldy in regard to making decisions? I think the more general point about the, um, the non-legally qualified member who is not a doctor, if you like, I think I made a comment about, I think they're really important in terms of the insight they bring into decision making <coughs> and the insight they bring into nature of disability and practical concerns. It would be nice, I'm aware that it's difficult for the tribunal service, but it would be nice if there could be perhaps more detailed regard to their particular expertise. And that's to do with, I think there's been a lot of publicity about problems around lack of understanding of people with mental health issues at the assessment stage, so not to do with tribunals. But somebody who is, for example, an occupational therapist dealing with physical disabilities wouldn't necessarily have a great insight into something like an autism spectrum disorder. It would be nice if the tribunal service could be looking to target things a little bit. I'm conscious we have to avoid unnecessary expense and people do have broader expertise, but it would be good, I think. Thank you. Any yeah, I agree with that as well. I think that's a very a very salient point. I think sub pools of the, the disability member, you know, with regard to what type of tribunal is, would yeah, be very Thank useful. Thank you, Mr. McAvoy. You wanted to. Um, I think we are broadly happy with the composition of tribunals with the three panel members. Um, one of the issues we did raise is that if, for example, you have a PIP claim um, that's maybe refused for a procedural reason, and the person appeals against that, that could potentially be held by a one-member panel which, if the appeal is successful, could mean that the decision just gets remitted back to the decision-making body, and it might be worth giving consideration to, in those cases, potentially a three-member um, panel, and if there's evidence available at that point, which would actually just allow the tribunal to make a decision on entitlement, might actually give a better outcome, rather than the process of having to remit it back for the decision-maker to make a decision, if the tribunal feel there's actually evidence here where we could actually just make a decision today. And obviously, if they feel they're not able to do that because they've only purely dealt with a procedural reason, they could still just remit it back in any case. Okay, um, thank you for that. Uh, my final question, uh, out with what we've already talked about, um, have you any other major concerns about the new regulations as they are in draft form that you'd want to highlight? to the committee this morning. Can I just make, a, little, yeah. can I just make a point about the <clears throat> um, representatives and supporters? I think the, you know, the, the, the issue about the, the drafting, I think it's been brought in because it's wide across all the other first tier tribunals. The, the, the drafting on what a supporter may assist the tribunal to do, um, providing moral support, yes. But when we get to the points about advising on points of law and procedure and issues with which the party might wish to raise with the tribunal, that seems to fit rather badly with the role of the representative. And I think what happens in most cases at tribunals just now is that the tribunal has a discretion to allow people in for moral support or indeed to, to hear evidence as witnesses. But the representative's role, obviously, is different from that. And my concern really is about supporters can't really um, be in a position to advise on points of law and procedure without stepping into the role of the representative. Okay, um, That's my only thoughts on it. I think... Um, yeah, I'm going to bring in Ms McPherson with a supplementary in this so it's a separate question. Oh, it's a separate question, right. OK, sorry. I'm, <laughs> I need, we need a signal in this, <laughs> this committee for supplementaries or not. Mr McAvoy, please. <laughs> Um, I'd actually considered the, the same point as, as Andy as well, um, but then I started to think of a situation where what if you did, for example, have a family member or somebody who was otherwise qualified as a representative or a solicitor or something and was actually able to provide the dual roles, 
if he specifically classified that a supporter wasn't able to advise on points of law, you could have a situation where there's a person in the room who, although they're a family member and maybe given evidence, is still actually able to guide the tribunal and maybe a point of law. And it wouldn't seem to me to make sense to specifically exclude that. And that might be fairly unusual circumstances, but um, it could arise. Um, supporters also seem in the draft regulations to be given the um, option advising on points of law, whereas that's actually not specifically given to representatives which seems to me to be quite a strange um, gap that representatives don't have that. Um, probably related to this issue, um, in the, the next evidence session, um, I think you might hear issues on um, appointees at tribunals and whether or not they're sometimes um, appointed inappropriately. Um, this is a big, big issue for us, supporting people who learn disabilities. A huge amount of people um, that we support at tribunal will have a representative. Um, and I think we would question whether or not a social security tribunal was the correct venue for a tribunal to be raising issues about whether or not somebody should potentially have an appointee or not. Um, I know there's uh, legislation going through at the minute about adults with incapacity, and I think something like that would be more appropriate rather than opening up the door for tribunals to potentially make referrals back to the decision-making body if they feel that uh, an appointee is maybe not appropriate for a person. Okay, Ms McCormick, yes. Yeah. Well, can I just say, from, from, I, I think the concept of supporters is, is an excellent idea. I don't have any issue in terms of principle. I think, yeah, no problem there at all. My difficulty actually comes a wee bit like following from Andy, the, the actual practicalities. Like if a family member uh, currently comes to an appeal tribunal with the, the appellant and the intention is that they're going to assist or possibly even give some kind of evidence, then they wouldn't be going into the room at the same time as the proceedings started. They would be called later on as a witness. So there would then be a decision to be made, like, is this person coming in as a supporter to sit and observe? Or, are they going to be, or, are they, or is the purpose of them being there to give additional evidence in support of the appellant's case? I think that would cause pr very, very practical problems, firstly for the tribunal, in determining, OK, you're in here, you've heard what the appellant has said, and you're possibly going to give evidence based on what you've heard, or is the person just going to be sitting there in terms of uh, providing moral support? The, the one thing I would say is, having represented many people, as my colleagues have, is very often I'm loath to bring in a family member very simply because it can restrict the evidence that the appellant wishes to give because it can, it can act as, almost as a deterrent because perhaps they don't want to tell you exactly everything that's going on in front of a family member who's accompanying them. So there's a judgment call to be made, um, certainly from a, from a representative's point of view, but I do think it, it needs to be clarified just exactly what are they doing and why are they in there in, in the room with the, with the appellant. And that's not to be negative, going back to my original point. Yeah. Maybe worth saying as well, I mean, the, um, the overriding objective seems to work on that matter really well at the present time. Uh, not often representatives are going about being positive, but I'm going to on that one. It seems to work very well, because in a situation where there is a supporter present, tribunals do or can ask for evidence from the supporter where appropriate. So it seems to work quite nicely without any greater formality to it than there is. Now, I'm not sure somebody else might disagree, but I think the flexibility is already in there without this. And I agree about the confusions. <coughs> any further comments? I'm going to move to Ms McNeil again. Thanks. Thank you. I wanted to ask what your experiences were of appeal decisions um, in terms of the time it takes to get a decision. Do you have any concerns about timescales or perfectly happy with, we, with your experiences to date? It works okay, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr McPherson, thanks. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. As well as sitting on this committee, I sit on the Justice Committee and we've been doing some uh, in inquiry at, at the moment around the increased use of alternative dispute resolution. And you'll note that in the draft first year tribunal regulations, Rule 3 makes reference to in, in, uh, use of mediation. And I wonder whether you can, in your experience, in, envisage circumstances in which mediation or other alternative dispute resolution might be helpful. Mr McAvoy? I, I couldn't really see situations where that would fit. 
Um, I think the current process works very well, apart from the mandatory reconsideration, and um, that the person lodges an appeal. It's always open to the decision maker to really change it at any point if any additional evidence is submitted. Um, I, I try to conceive of situations where that might help in social security, but I was struggling. I, I would have a, a principled concern, I think, because what we're talking about here are people asserting their rights as opposed to people trying to reach a reasoned conclusion. Now, normally with mediation or any of those things, you would tend to be thinking, you go in and you start with the, you have at the back of your mind the premise that you may concede some things because it's better to get an agreement overall for everybody. And I think the rights-based nature of things ten, potentially disappears in mediation, so that would really concern me. The other is, there's an issue of um, equality of arms in there because the claimant is not, d just simply does not have the backup that an agency, however well intentioned, has. So I, I agree. Any further comment, Ms. No, that's that, that's my question. Thank you. Um, can I just finally ask is there anything that you want to get on record today that hasn't been covered in the questioning or in your submissions to the committee this morning? Any final thoughts? Um, y yes. Um, there's a, a reference in here to both representatives or supporters potentially being barred from the proceedings. And again, not a question for the committee, but it did occur to me, you obviously try and imagine a situation where that's going to arise, and then you think, what do you do when it goes wrong? And that would be a very cumbersome process. It looks to me the way it's written. Now, tribunals at the present time it's difficult to imagine because, generally speaking, tribunals are very good, very reasonable, very supportive of claimants and representatives, all of that. But if something goes wrong, it becomes very, very difficult to challenge it, I think. And it, these are very, very broad grounds for barring somebody. Um, so we'd be quite concerned about that, both for representatives and, as it happens, for supporters. I would have thought that that the sort of situation where somebody ought to be barred, from my perspective, as in because they're disruptive or acting against the interests of the claimant, could be dealt with otherwise under the procedure rules. Anything else? No. Can I thank you all for your attendance to the committee this morning? I'll suspend briefly while we change the witness panels. Uh, thank you, and can I welcome our second panel to committee this morning, uh, Jessica Burns, who's a regional tribunal judge, social security and child support, Paul Dumbleton, disability qualified tribunal member, Dr Patricia Moultrie, medically qualified tribunal member, and Professor Tom Mullen, member of former Scottish Tribunals and Administrative Justice Advisory Committee. And again, I would like to thank you all for the submissions that you've given to the committee before today. Um, so I, I, just as a general opening question, I, I would just, just ask if you've got any concerns or any, any um, comments on, on where we are at the moment in terms of the proposals. I, I don't know who'd like to go first on that one. Um, well, it's, it's quite an open-ended question, but perhaps a starting point for me was my understanding was that 
the rules um, would follow as closely the rules that apply at the moment. Um, I can understand why the Scottish Government would want to depart from those if it was shown that they weren't fit for purpose or that they were causing any difficulties. But my understanding is that they're not, and I think the evidence you've already heard from representatives um, really supports that. And my overall concern is that in a desire to try and make things better in some sort of unspecified way, the proposed rules are um, more prescriptive than they need be. And in fact, um, overall might lead to confusion, particularly at a time when we're anticipating sometime in the future that the same tribunal will actually hear appeals from devolved and reserved aspects of social security law. So you would then have rules that were either different or rules that had to be amended to take account of that change. Um, and for me, that just seems um, disproportionate, confusing, and perhaps not in the interests of any of the users of any appeal system. Okay, any further opening comments on that area? Not at all? Okay, I'm going to move to further questions from the panel. Mr. Tompkins, you've indicated. Thank you, Kamina. Um, I remind members of my register of interest in that I am, like Professor Mullen, a member of the University of Glasgow School of Law. Um, I wanted to ask the panel um, about, the, uh, about what the regulations and indeed also what the Social Security Bill currently says um, about the um, role that will be played in um, litigation before tribunals of both the principles um, and the charter. Um, and um, a number of you gave either oral or written evidence to the um, uh, committee um, when we were looking at the um, Social Security Bill at Stage 2, and you'll have seen that the bill's been amended, um, to seek to clarify what the role will be legally of both the principles and the Charter, which is to say that um, courts and tribunals can take them into account in relevant cases, um, uh, um, but uh, they create no new cause of action. On them, of, of, in and of themselves. Now, the regulations, of course, talk about overriding interests and talk about the Charter. Do, do you have any concerns about um, unintended consequences of either these amendments or these provisions, or do you think that this is uh, now reasonably clear and we can be uh, confident that the um, establishment of the principles and of the Charter, which we all support right across the political spectrum, um, will not lead to unnecessary future litigation challenging their legal status or, um, or effects or consequences? In that one, I mean, I think the amendments have made the status of the both the, the principles and the charter clearer, uh, in that they can be taken into account by a court or tribunal. Um, I think it still leaves considerable scope for how that actually works out in practice. Um, I think we know now that a tribunal is not then, for example, obliged to decide in accordance with the perceived human rights uh, of the claimant just because human rights is a principle and is mentioned in the Charter. But it clearly can take some account uh, of the notion of human rights when, when making decisions. That, that seems to be what it says. So I wonder, though, if it might raise expectations that people can use human rights arguments as additional arguments when they don't think an argument based squarely on the entitlement regulations will you know, give the claimant the benefit they seek. So I think it may raise that sort of expectation. Um, but but I, I, obviously the, the, the members are better qualified to say than I, but I doubt if tribunals would be comfortable um, using human rights type arguments um, in the context of benefits which are essentially defined by precise regulations. I think the default position of tribunals is going to be, this is what it says in the regulations and I'm going to decide in accordance with that. And if that conflicts with some conception of the individual's human rights, then give preference to the regulations because that's what the entitlement is. So I think there is a risk that it will create a perception that there is an ability to use broad legal human rights arguments to a significant extent when in practice it actually won't be possible 
for people to, to do that, to get results by doing that. Does anyone else? Just to say, practical purposes, if there was an argument um, on that basis at the moment, it's something that the first tier tribunal wouldn't uh, really have jurisdiction over. They'd have to remit it um, to the upper tribunal uh, to address. So it's not really something that would arise um, very commonly. Um, I mean, I can understand why you'd want principles and charters to underpin everything to do with any new social security system. I think that's right. I just, it's difficult for me to envisage how that would really impact on the sort of decision making that the tribunal would make, looking at much more detailed entitlement provisions. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Just, just very, very quick follow up and, and, and th thank you um, but, um, both of you for those answers which are very helpful. Um, can I just ask, I very much share the concern that Professor Mullen articulated that we don't want um, unreasonably to raise expectations. I mean, we want to raise expectations that the, that the agency is going to get as much right first time as it possibly can do. We, we then need to deliver on those expectations rather than frustrate them. There is no point in raising expectations that people in Scotland will be able to make you know, highfalutin or broad brush or very impressive arguments based on international human rights principles if, if, the, if the reality is that those expectations are only going to be frustrated when tribunals um, hear uh, cases and decide them according, in, in accordance with very detailed and prescriptive regulations rather than general principles of international hu human rights. All that does is upset people. There's no need to do that at all. So the question is, do, do, is it the panel's view that there are any further amendments that are required, either to the bill, because we still have one more chance to amend the bill, um, or um, indeed to the regulations which are in front of us today, to, in, to ensure that there is no unnecessary raising of expectations which are only inevitably going to be um, uh, frustrated, or um, would the members of the panel leave the um, drafting as it is at the moment? any changes and the uh, you know just in the broad aspect of um, expectation uh, I, you know you could go back to the mandatory reconsideration argument that uh, we've already had um, uh, uh, aired this morning um, but because that is an issue about access and there are human rights issues about that and about um, uh, discouraging appellants who may feel that um, any additional steps and processes is a discouragement to a remedy. Yes, I would suggest amendment because I think you're either then going to clarify it in the direction of human rights or other general things being more strictly enforceable, which I don't think you want to do, or you're then going to go in the direction of it has no effect at all, which I don't, I don't think the committee wants to do either. So I would think it's okay to leave it as it is and just be aware of the the danger of expectations being unduly raised. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Balfour? Um, uh, good morning, and thank you uh, for coming. I, I've just got three quick questions. I suppose just to go back to the one that I raised with the first panel in regard to expenses. Um, do you see this happening in reality, and, and is it a power that you think the first tier tribunal is welcome to have? I, I, I'm I just haven't seen the arguments about including it. I don't know where it came from. There's absolutely no demand from a tribunal perspective of ever wanting those powers. And um, I, I'm not sure where their place is in this sort of um, tribunal. I, I can't really say more than that, but I don't see for me, the starting point is where we are with the rules at present, because they're the ones I know, and it's never been an issue that those rules do not confer the power to award any costs or expenses. I think it's that in most tribunals across different subject matters, there hasn't been a power to award expenses or a demand from those tribunals to be able to award it. And it does seem to go against the idea that tribunals are meant to be more accessible than courts. And as we all know, one of the barriers to going to court is the fear of having expenses awarded against you. Um, thank you. Um, one of the issues I think frustrates all tribunals and 
Um, also, is the number of adjournments that can happen in cases for lots of different reasons. And, and I wonder whether you had any suggestions around the, these draft strikes. Is, is there anything that could be done at an earlier stage that we could put within um, these regulations to reduce the number of adjournments? Um, is there anything procedurally wise that could happen in regard to reduce the number of adjournments? Or is that just part of the process that we have to live with? I wonder if I could just make some comment about medical evidence in appeals, um, because quite a common um, reason to adjourn is because we're concerned about lack of medical evidence. And, and I have to say also quite a common reason, in my opinion, that an appeal succeeds is because we receive further medical evidence um, prior to the appeal, which hasn't been available to the original decision maker. And I, from my perspective as a medical member of tribunals, I would really like to see a move towards some medical evidence being available at original decision making. There's been a lot of discussion today about getting it right first time and in my view if there was a possibility of an agreed data extraction from GP records to be available to the original decision maker which would then be available for any further reconsideration and which would then be available to the appeal service, that would help the evidence base that underpins the original decision making. And I know that there's been difficult, and there was reference before to GP practices struggling with workload and their ability to provide reports and requests, but producing a computerised extract from the medical records is not difficult, and we've got agreed data extractions for other purposes. And that, you know, I, I think it's slightly off the topic of the appeals, but I, I do think it's relevant to the appeals and it's relevant to adjournments, and I would hope there'll be consideration given to agreeing a, a data extraction from GP records which will be available to the original decision maker. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Donald. Could I just, just add that <coughs> medical evidence is, is really useful, but there is sometimes other useful professional evidence that, that doesn't get as much emphasis as medical evidence, particularly um, if people are, for example, in receipt of community care support, that can be the evidence that was that, like a care plan that was put together to, for, for them to get the support from the local council would be very, very useful. And again, th that can lead to the same sorts of, of um, delays that we were speaking about. So I, I think it's medical and other relevant uh, professional evidence. Uh, which kind of takes me to the, the next question is, from your experience of having sat on tribunals over a number of years, why do you think percentage why so many tribunals are successful compared to the decision that is made by, by a present with DLA? Is, is there something more fair about the tribunal and, and what lessons can the new agency learn from the tribunals so that there are less appeals coming forward? I mean, I'm very focused on the medical aspects of things but I, I think that in my experience what happens in tribunals is, is many things but one of the things that happens is that the level of disability arising from people's medical conditions is explored in some detail. That we have, um, we start from the understanding of what the likely disabilities are arising from somebody's medical conditions, and we ask a lot of questions. And, we, and the disability member is extremely helpful in that, also in, the, in, in asking the appropriate questions. So my thoughts are that the the current medical assessment process, although it's attracted a lot of a, a negative attention in some ways, I think it's an extremely difficult thing to undertake is a medical assessment, but I think that it strikes me that, the, that some of those assessments are undertaken in a very sort of routine formulaic way where a process is applied to somebody no matter what the medical conditions and disabilities that they have. And I think that the medical assessment process um, could be improved by strengthening the starting point and them being more bespoke to the medical condition that the person has. So. I think that that is what happens when people come to the tribunals, that, w that we have a pre-hearing discussion as to what the likely disabilities and impairments the person will have, and we construct our questions in detail to, to address those. So, I mean, uh, that is, and I think that, that we come for, at the disability from a sort of biopsychosocial model of disability and not a truly medical um, assessment. And I completely agree with what was said um, by my colleague that it, Although I'm talking about medicine, I'm probably using that more narrowly. It's that we very much understand that it, disability is more complex than, than purely medicine, but I think that um, 
Yeah, that, that would be my comments, that we explore in detail. We ask a lot of questions of the person. We don't accept the first answer. You know, we'll ask, we'll make sure we really are understanding the level of disability and difficulty the person has. Thanks. Um, can I bring in? Oh, sorry. Um, did maybe, you want maybe to just add that, mm -hmm. that tribunals often do have more evidence than the decision maker mm -hmm. as well, that in the intervening period, so often supported by the agencies that have been speaking to you this morning, people are gathering more evidence. And so very often that there is evidence before us that the decision maker didn't even see. Mm. And I think that makes a big difference. Uh, can I bring in Ms McNeil? Uh, yeah, thank you. I've got a few questions for different areas. Um, I raised this question at stage two on behalf of Sam H, and that is the uh, question of ordinary members on the tribunal with lived experience. Um, they have a concern that, that they're not using the mod model used by the mental health tribunals and that there will be certain panels that will have um, an ordinary member with lived experience. I just wondered if you had any views on that you could share with the committee. Perhaps I'll start with the comments. Um, you'll be aware that all the uh, judges, uh, medical members and disability uh, qualified panel members are appointed by the Judicial Appointments Commission uh, in terms of the uh, um, criteria that are set out. So um, it's not a matter for the tribunal organization really having an overview of people's background. Once they're appointed, they're appointed. Um, and they're generally appointed up to the age of 70. So the issue of appointing someone who's perhaps got lived experience, it might apply at that time, but that expertise or that experience may not see them through the whole term of their appointment. Um, it's perfectly true that uh, an, a number of our uh, disability qualified panel members are in receipt of benefits and they're sitting on... Um, determination or decisions uh, that relate to, to benefits that they might be receiving. But that's certainly not within the culture of sitting on a tribunal that people take their own personal experience and try and apply it because we know the limits of that and it, it, it's, it, you have to open up a generality. And my fear is that if you have somebody that's appointed specifically for one purpose, then perhaps their focus on just looking at a wide range of cases uh, isn't as effective. And I think one of the things that we have achieved um, with the widespread of people from diverse backgrounds that sit um, as our disability qualified members is that um, you do, over time, create a real sense that they are building up an expertise across a much wider area than the area they might have known about on appointment. And this happens through um, targeted training so that we identify areas that are a weakness. Perhaps we had recent training, for instance, on um, autism and mental health issues, uh, particularly relating to children. Um, and it's really through that that we try and um, a very flexible number of disability members. Paul, you might want to make some comments on that. Yeah, I, I was interested to see what Sam H had proposed. Um, my, and, and I, I do have lived experience of, of being the, the carer of, you know, the, the, the father of a, of a daughter with a learning disability who is in receipt of DLA. So I do meet that criterion. However, I, I'm not convinced that it's, it should be set as, 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 as an essential criterion for people in, in the role. And is there, there are a couple of reasons for that. And it, 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 it isn't to, to do with not valuing people's lived experience. I think in the process that you're in now of devising a new benefit system, people's lived experience should be heard very, very loudly. But I'm not sure that in, in what goes on in a tribunal where you're making a decision about someone's entitlement against a particular set of criteria, the lived experience is as important or and, uh, so that, that that would be one one aspect that the other is that I saw that Sam H went on to to say that they felt that this might address people's concerns about not feeling that 
they, they were respected or treated with dignity in tribunals. And, and again, I, 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 with long experience of working in the field of disability, I'm, I'm not sure that, that you can necessarily expect people with disabilities to be more or less respectful of other people just because they have a disability. So I, 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 didn't, I, I couldn't see the logic in what they were arguing. It's perfectly possible to, to have a disability yourself or to have a, a relative with a disability and still be disrespectful. <laughs> and, and, and the opposite. So I, 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 I wouldn't necessarily... I, I, I find myself surprised not to support what they're suggesting, but I, I, I don't actually support it. Thank you. I have another question, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about something um, on a separate issue. That is about um, the appointment of judges. Will, to your knowledge, will there be the appointment of new tribunal judges under the devolved system? Um, can you give the committee any information about um, any training that might take place? And just, I'll just tag on the end of that. that um, I wondered if you also had a view that, um, I suppose, in the interest of transparency, that whether or not, the, not, not the uh, text of the judgments, but the outcomes of judges should be published um, for the public to see how many decisions have been upheld and those who haven't been upheld. Well, I, I'm actually a supporter of um, tribunals being as transparent as possible. I know it comes as a surprise to some people to know that there are public hearings our hearings are public unless there's an order that there's a good reason they be held in private. That's very rarely exercised, simply because it's very rare that a member of the public actually turns up and says, oh, I just want to sit in and see what goes on. But I think in order to create um, a sense of the transparency, it, it would be helpful for at least people to see what a tribunal decision looks like. It's very difficult to access something like that if you go online to see what a statement of reasons looks like that if somebody, if somebody wants to challenge a tribunal um, decision, they, they have to ask for a statement of reasons. It's very, very difficult to find out what those look like unless you're actually um, working in the field. Um, and also just to get a sense of what the outcomes are. And... Um, <coughs> In a court situation, it would be bizarre not to be able to access that sort of information. And given that we are a, a public hearing, then I think there should be a higher element of transparency. I think it might also take away some of the uh, mystique, really, from what happens uh, at tribunals. One question you asked the representatives was, was there any concern about delays in tribunals issuing decisions and perhaps I should just say that the current practice is that tribunals are supported by a clerk and um, in I would say 95% of cases tribunals um, issue the decision on the day to the people they wait they get a typed copy of that decision in their hand to go away with them and a note of what they can do if they want to challenge that decision in the event of uh, the appeal not being successful. So at that point, they know they get to the tribunal. They know that will be the day virtually always that they get the decision. Um, there's not a sense of just not knowing when they're going to find out about what happened. Um, and I think that goes a long way to um, allaying people's anxieties about it. And it also means when they get the decision, um, most appellants in Scotland are supported by representatives who can talk that through with them. Thank you very much. Any, any further questions for the panel? Um, is there anything that you would like to say to the committee that's not been covered for the questioning today before we finish? Everybody content that they've voiced everything they wanted to. Well, um, again, thank you very much for your attendance uh, and your submissions to the committee. And um, you, we're about to move into private session. Just before we do, I'd like to um, mention that Laura, Laura Cochram, who's been on secondment to the committee, is going back to her role in Edinburgh University and to thank her for her contribution and support to the committee. And on that note, we're going to move into private session.